You're listening to The Higher Ed Marketer, a podcast geared towards marketing professionals in higher education. This show will tackle all sorts of questions related to student recruitment, donor relations, marketing trends, new technologies, and so much more. If you're looking for conversations centered around where the industry is going, this podcast is for you. Let's get into the show. Hello, and welcome to the Higher Ed Marketer Podcast. My name is Troy Singer, and I have a very special episode for you today. We're going to make a bit of a format shift for today's episode and recap the top 10 most useful moments of the show so far. It's kind of like our best of. Whether you're brand new to listening or have been here since the beginning, you don't have to search for the best nuggets of information because they're all right here, hand-selected for you. So without further ado, let's get into our list. Coming in at number 10 is a snippet from Darrell Smith in episode three, where he tells us that marketing alignment should be the leading data insights for your institution's program. Let's have a listen. So they're already tracking and giving you some sort of sense of what type of engagement they're having, whether it's websites, landing pages, emails, text messages. But is there other data sources around campus that... Uh, maybe admissions counselors understand they want to have and you want to work into your marketing communications and then making sure that the communication networks are there with those stakeholders. You know, having that in data analysts there with the counselors at the personal touch, with the webmasters, with all the digital content experts in that conversation flow so you can align all these skill sets together and have them moving in the same direction when you you know, want them to move. So they kind of keep in sync. And then once you figure out that process, keeping that process repetitive so that it's always iterating, always cycling, because I'm sure, you know, you want the messaging, the marketing messaging to be as flexible as it can when you want that, you know, message to change and shift. Next up at number nine, we hear J.P. Spagnolo's two core elements of marketing. I truly believe marketing starts in a couple of uh, core things. One is understanding your messages, right? Um, But the messages are all about building relationships, right? The intent is to be able to strengthen the relationships with the prospective students, if that's the target market you're working with. Um, In my role, you know, I serve both the prospective student audience as well as the other uh, elements of marketing on campus. And in every one of those places, it's about making sure that you have strong relationships and being able to help people understand um, and to learn from other people what it is that we're trying to do to create the right messages, right? Um, And so I think that's really important. I'd say another part of it is recognizing where your strengths are and also knowing where you need to have partners and have other people um, take the weight and, you know, make sure that they are able to express, um, you know, what it is that that they bring to the table. And, And so, you know, I would say in the role that I have, a lot of it is that ability to really recognize what the needs are, um, and make sure that we're organizing in a way that we're using the strengths of those around us to be able to craft our message um, in a clear and concise manner to the different audiences that we're trying to do that with. In episode 11, however, we get introduced to Suzanne Petrucci's more measured approach to higher ed marketing, where she reminds us that great marketing is all about the subtle reminders. The other two people have been situated under digital marketing so that we would have a digital marketing specialist whose primary responsibilities focused on social media. That can take up such an enormous amount of time, and it's not just a matter of going out and capturing what's happening that day. It really needs to be a strategic, planful exercise so that we have a full editorial calendar with it, but we also can be agile enough to be able to pick up of-the-moment happenings on campus so that we don't miss those things. Weighing in at number seven is a little gem from episode 12 and something that we all know all too well. A picture is truly worth a thousand words, and we'll hear why we should invest in video according to Peter Ashley at Hanover College. And so we needed more video resources. So we had a chance to hire a new videographer and I was able to hire two videographers um, because we had great final candidates. But I made the case that, hey, we will put these these guys to work uh, quickly. And we did, and we hired both. And and one is a a young woman who graduated from DePaul University. One is a a gentleman who recently graduated from Hanover. And so having those two perspectives, uh, 
both very talented uh, videographers and photographers. And within a few months, they'd created more than 100 plus videos um, on campus life, generating like 100,000 views very quickly. Uh, Everything from campus dining to Greek life to a series we've created called Beyond the Classroom, where we take um, either a music program or even a kinesiology program and take it outside the classroom and show what, what goes on in that program that doesn't just happen in the actual room. You know, the, for one program, there was a, a whole focus on the using the natural setting of Hanover to go on hikes and to look at mm-hmm. count waterfalls and to identify bugs and different things like that. Number six is a huge challenge for dealing with donors because honestly, when someone drops an eight-figure gift on your donor program, it's hard not to treat them like the favorite. Episode 13's Colleen Garland and Janet Martson at Kenyon College have you covered on creating the proper management of these donors. In addition to just knowing that intuitively, we had under, um, taken a study with a, the group called the Art and Science Group to really understand our, our constituency, donor motivations, what was working. And so we knew that there was a risk in, when associating a gift of this magnitude that somehow your other donors would sit on the sidelines and applaud, but not necessarily see how it was impacting them. So that definitely informed our strategy. And fortunately, we had a group that that met, including Janet, every other week for about nine months, trying to think through carefully, if this gift were to come to fruition the way we were hoping, how would we be prepared to roll it out? So it was definitely a team effort to be prepared for the messaging. Colleen and Janet get a second mention here with tip five by sharing their way of shifting video strategy to fit the message your institution wants to send. The piece I would say that became very apparent, though, was just the importance of video and the increased use of video and photography, because as we've been talking about, like the place is so powerful. And when alumni see photos and images it immediately brings them back. It tugs at an emotional connection to the place in in ways that words alone can't. So we did indeed increase our use of video for things like this big gift announcement, which of course we couldn't do in person, but other things that we did as well in terms of we we renamed our big athletic center for a very beloved and and well-known alumnus. That was all done through the use of video. And so we tried to really, as Janet said in the beginning, appropriately share good news, but in the context of what was going on in the world. And that required just what felt like a near constant pivoting and adjusting and, you know, waiting till the last minute to make sure everything was, you know, just right to that moment when it was going to be released. Coming in at number four, some of you might be just getting started in the arena of higher ed marketing. And Dan Freeborn at Northern Michigan University has this advice for your journey. Find more from Dan in episode 14. I took what I knew from that and understanding the main touch points that students um, had with the university throughout the enrollment process really just helped me build a shell of what our email communication was going to look like. So looking at when they submit an application, they should probably get something initially confirming that we received their application and what their next step was. Same with um, after they were admitted, making sure they knew what their next steps for enrollment were. So building out content related to those specific action steps was my key point. Um, And that allowed me then to rest assured that they were getting the main points delivered to them, the main pieces of content they needed. And then from there, I was able to kind of step up, take a step back and look more at that information at a whole and was able to develop the communication plan much further than building out and filling out those gaps in between the pieces of messaging there. So it it did take a lot of time, um, but I think taking it in bite-sized chunks was the most, was the key for me um, to be able to do this successfully, resting assured that they had the main points out there. And then every so often, maybe every six or eight months, I would introduce some more content to build out these campaigns and flows that way. We're into our top three tips and our bronze medalist for this is episode number nine with the University of Kentucky's Julie Baylog. Her insight into creation of segmented messaging for prospective students is tremendously valuable, showing how creating unique messaging for each student creates an opportunity for transformation. So what we did is, for instance, um, we, we've 
created an op-ed, a joint op-ed with some of our other universities across the state. And so we're publishing those with other university presidents from our president. We also are creating some social media um, assets and we are going to push those out. And then working with our um, uh, there's a, a person on Jay Blanton's staff, Mark Witt, who specializes in um, media pitching. And he's going to help us by reaching out to small town newspapers, radio stations, um, and TV stations across the state to really share. Listen, we, we need college is possible for you, but it has to start with filling out your FAFSA. And at the end of the day, this is one of those things where I like to say we're the University for Kentucky, not just the University of Kentucky, because at the end of the day, we just want these students to understand that they um, that going to college can be transformational for them. And, it, and if they don't come to UK, that's OK. They just need to find the place where they can get that transformational experience. Our number two tip comes from episode eight and UNC Charlotte's Christy Jackson. It's one of the most pointed pieces of advice about marketing and communication for anyone who has to interact with the public. Crisis means different things depending on your experience and your institution. After the institution that I was working at announced closure, I was in conversation with the president of another institution. And we were talking just talking about what had happened and how it had happened and the response. And this person was trying to empathize with me. And they said to me, you know, I get it. Crisis is so hard. I understand what you're going through. Last year, the health department gave our dining hall a B rating. And this person meant it with every good intention. And to them, to them, that was a crisis because they had, they had never really experienced that level of scrutiny before. And their students were upset. The families were upset. They're paying for this money for these dining plans. And you're giving my child subpar food. And it was awful for them in the moment they were in it. Now, for me and others of my colleagues who have perhaps experienced something that's a little more intense, we would say that's probably a Tuesday, right? A B health rating on a college campus, probably a Tuesday. You need to address it. It's an issue, but you can manage it. It's not, it is not a seismic, potential seismic shift for your organization if you don't handle it correctly. Finally, at number one is the snippet from episode five, Christy LaFree and Butler University's truly unique approach to getting some beloved family members involved in the higher ed journey. FIDO usually doesn't have a say where a student chooses to attend, but by interacting with prospective students' pets, they create a whole new layer of connection with their prospect. But I think this will be the fifth year that we've done this campaign, and and we call it our pet complo. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We send direct mail to the dogs and cats of admitted students with a a little piece of butler gear and that note, just reassuring them that Blue is going to look after their human and and have their humans back and be there for anything they may need at Butler. And uh, there's so many things about this campaign that I love. You know, of course, everyone loves getting Butler gear. And the personalization factor is is really fun. But I think the I think the piece that makes it most successful is that message. The message that we're kind of subtly sending in that piece that we've got their back and mm-hmm. they're going to find a family at Butler and that community that that high schoolers are often looking for. Right. And we have just found that that really resonates with the Butler way and, and resonates with who we are as an institution. The real gold in this campaign, too, I think, is the awareness piece. So the yield part of it, great, fantastic. The awareness, though, is is the piece that's a little bit harder to measure. But we we have found is that for every family who receives the piece, they tell their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers, et cetera, and they're often posting to their own social accounts. So um, that piece we've been really pleased with, too just knowing that we're able to get the Butler brand in front of a whole bunch of eyeballs. But yeah, the first time I pitched it, rightfully so, there were some questions about (laughs) what do you want to do and how are we going to do that? But we have a lot of fun with it and it's by far one of our our favorite campaigns to execute. That rounds out our top 10 tips for the show so far. We're looking so forward to continue to bring you great guests and content to help your higher ed marketing journey. I'm Troy Singer. Thanks for listening. The Higher Ed Marketer Podcast is sponsored by Kaler Solutions, an education marketing and branding agency, and by Think Patented, a marketing execution, printing, and mailing provider of Higher Ed Solutions. On behalf of my co-host, Bart Kaler, I'm Troy Singer. Thank you for joining us. 
You've been listening to The Higher Ed Marketer. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you're listening with Apple Podcasts, we'd love for you to leave a quick rating of the show. Simply tap the number of stars you think the podcast deserves. Until next time.